Okay. So Equipa is Agile Consultancy. Uh, we have three uh, missions. We have a uh, uh, one million mission to spread three message, one entrepreneurship, self-organization, and balanced workplace. This is the scaling up event series. Uh, we have master class for 3 November, I guess, 3 November. And if you guys want to know further about the scaling up series and want to know the master class, you can scan the QR code here. The scaling up event series is quite different with the Azure Silkas. Uh, we more talk about the how the startup uh, uh, run and operate and how to survive scaling up. This is the master class. This is one day event. One day uh, event learn from the masters, Netherlands. And Hugo Messer, of course, the founder of Equipa, and already uh, implement the scaling up in Bridge. Bridge is one of the company uh, Hugo had and already achieved a lot of things since implement the scaling up. You can scan the QR code here to know further about the masterclass. And then this is the free ebook. You know, free ebook. <laughs> you guys can scan here also and download the scaling up workbook. This is a glimpse of the scaling up operating system that you guys can implement in your company. Not only from startup, if you guys from the corporate, maybe can implement like 50% of the scaling up. It is actually the operating system you guys can implement. Okay, without further ado, Hugo, please welcome. Thank you, Dinda, for the intro and all the promo. <laughs> and I don't have to do that. <laughs> yeah. Let me share my screen. Visible. Yeah, visible, but not in the slide. Okay, all good now. Yeah, okay. So my sharing today is about how I screwed up. So I'll just walk you through my early days as a founder, entrepreneur, and all the mistakes that I made, and then share what insights I gained over time, and also how scaling up saved my life. Of course, there's more than scaling up, but I do... I did experience that the framework or the operating system, as Dinda calls it, helps a lot to find out what to focus on or what to do as a startup. And I also see that there's quite some people from larger companies in the call. And I think the some of these concepts equally apply to structuring a bigger organization or maybe even a product team or a startup within a larger organization. So I'll give a short intro about myself. Uh, this is, uh, I, I'm, I'm uh, Dari Blanda, I'm Dutch. So I put a cow here because everybody in Holland uh, has cows in the garden and wears wooden shoes. And uh, I live in Bali right now. So I moved here six, year ago, six years ago. And uh, after that, I figured out that Indonesia is on a journey to become more agile. And that's why I started the Keeper, but I'll tell more about that later on. So right now I have several companies and some of them I'll talk about more today, but not all of them. So Br Bridge is my first company and Equipa is the one that uh, that you are part of right now. Uh, Bali Investment Club is an angel network and next year also a fund which invests in impact startups. So companies doing stuff around sustainability, plastic, waste management, agriculture, and Supercharges is uh, a venture builder helping startups to scale up. Similar to what Akipa does, but earlier stage. So about myself, I was, I think, 10 or 11 when I decided that I want to become an entrepreneur. So I was quite young, like at a young age, I was convinced that I want to start my own company. I had an uncle 
who had a trading company. So he imported jewelry from, I think, China, Indonesia, India. And uh, he showed me his warehouse, a very big warehouse. He also uh, drove a Porsche uh, Carrera. And I thought, oh, that's really good. That's what I also want to, to do later on. So he inspired me to, at a young age, decide I want to become an entrepreneur. And the studies I did, which I thought would help me to become an entrepreneur, was an MBA. Now, at that time in, in Holland, there was almost no study around entrepreneurship at university level. I think right now, I studied at the Erasmus in Rotterdam. I think right now they do have stuff around entrepreneurship, even masters, and maybe even a whole direction. But at that time, there, there was none. So they actually educated me or educated everyone to work in a big corporation. So they taught you, you know, finance of big companies, uh, running big companies, structures in big companies. And all the time I was thinking, okay, when is the topic of entrepreneurship uh, coming? And it never came. So once I finished the studies, I actually, at, when I did my, my internship and my thesis, I started my own company together with two friends. So I, I decided to learn entrepreneurship by myself because the MBA didn't ta teach me. But still, after the studies, I thought, okay, I, I, I read so many books. I studied for four years and I got it all figured out. So I'm a born entrepreneur. And with all this knowledge, I will most likely succeed very quickly. This was also around the internet bubble. So prior to 2001, prior to my... Uh, graduation there were a lot of startups and 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 the whole internet bubble came up and a lot of vc money floating around like like the past few years in indonesia and then 2001 everything crashed and and i think that's happening again right now over here so uh, although i thought that i've got it all figured out the, i worked one and a half year on that startup which i started started together with two friends in my studies and this was a it was actually a very good idea, but the execution of the idea was incredibly complicated. And we were very green and didn't have any experience or knowledge about what we were doing. So the, the, the idea was to create a photography system for amusement parks. So this was the time when internet came up and RFID technology was also becoming quite mainstream. So we had that Michiel was one of the guys who I started out with. He had this idea to combine those two technologies. So when you go to Disneyland, you get an RFID ch D chip at the entrance of Disneyland. Then you walk around the park everywhere and there's cameras located all throughout the park. And those cameras are triggered by your RFID chip. So the cameras would take spontaneous pictures of your family walking around or whatever, whatever you're doing over there. And then by the end of the uh, they in Disneyland, you hand in your RFID chip, you give the code that was linked to that chip, and then you could download all the, uh, or you could see all the pictures that were taken of you in the boot or also at home, because we connected it to a system where with the code that you got from the chip, you would be able to see all the, all the pictures that were taken. And the thing which I did after this was we submitted it to one of the early, at least in Holland, there was almost no accelerator or incubator or anything. So Accenture at that time was uh, running a program for, for, ide for ideas. So it was idea phase startups. And we joined that competition. So the thesis that I had written or the, the document that I had written for my internship, we, we changed this and submitted it to the competition. And then we won. So we got it was guilders in that time, but 200,000 guilders, around 100,000 euros in consulting hours for Accenture, from Accenture, and uh, I think 15,000 in cash. Now, the 15,000 was nice, but if you get guys in a suit walking around corporations to, write, to help a startup, they had absolutely no idea what they had to do with us. So after we won the comp competition, it was silent for two weeks, and then eventually we decided to approach them, and they came up or we came up with the idea that, okay, let them rewrite our business plan, make a very good case, uh, Excel sheet, financial model, everything. And they did that. They took three months with four guys. They spent a lot of time on, they, they burned 100,000. And then at the end, we had a new business plan, which was supposed to go to VCs so they could invest in our company. But exactly during that period, all the VCs stopped investing because the internet bubble burst. And we actually never got a VC. We burned all that money with Accenture. And then we had actually nothing after that, except for a very expensive business plan. So at that time, I also decided that we'll never join an accelerator or program or whatever anymore after that. 
I do think there's merit because the programs have become much more mature right now. I know that uh, Sam is here from Founders Institute, so I'm sure there are programs that are very valuable. At that time, people didn't know how to help start us because it was a sort of new phenomenon. Uh, and for me, it was the conclusion I don't do that anymore. So after that, I had no more money and I had to get a job. And actually, when I was younger, I decided I never, ever want to get a job because that seemed like something I didn't want to do. I wanted to set up my own company and run my own business. But I had to because if you have no money, then what do you do? So I worked one and a half year in a company to create an entertainment guide for uh, Amsterdam. And it was actually a great experience because I learned a lot about sales, about not run, how, not, how to not run a company like the guy uh, who was running the company. And um, after one and a half year, he went bust. So one day, he, like, I worked day and night for him. And then one day he said, you go, sorry, we're, we're, we're going bankrupt. And uh, the executors of the bankruptcy are going to come next week. So I had no more work, but the Dutch government is very nice. So they paid me three months, I think, in salary uh, after the bankruptcy or half year. I don't know how much, but they, they keep paying you because you are the victim of a bankruptcy as an employee. So that was a very good benefit of being an employee, because if you're an entrepreneur, they would never do that. They just think, oh, you, you went bust and it's your own problem. Figure it out. So with that money that I got from the government, I did a trip to India in 2004. So this is me uh, laying in the Rajasthan desert, thinking about what to do with the rest of my life. And at that time, I was think I had decided that okay, I go I go do a trip for six months, and and after that I start my company. So I was thinking I had a few ideas, and one of the ideas was to start an outsourcing company because at that time a lot of U.S. based companies were outsourcing their IT to India, and I figured that that same movement would probably come to Europe very soon. I also realized that. Uh, it wasn't that easy to communicate to Indian uh, guys at the, uh, because I had no intercultural experience. So I figured, okay, let's let's not make it too complicated. When I when I start, I start nearby. So I I set up uh, Bridge Global with the first office in uh, Ukraine, or first I worked with partners in Ukraine because it it's nearby, it's easier to communicate. Right now, it would be a little bit challenging, but at that time there was no war and Ukraine was very peaceful. So IT was actually very booming in, in Ukraine in the last decade. Um, the other decision that I had made was that I did not want to work with co-founders anymore. So I, this is like a picture of a lonely guy. I thought I, I'm going to do it alone without anybody else because I felt that I spent a lot of time aligning with the other two co-founders about strategy, what idea to work on, how to move forward, what to do with Accenture, with the investment, et cetera. And I'm very impatient, so I always thought, okay, like, let's just not make it too complicated. Let's go left or let's go right and make a decision. And it took a lot of energy, so I decided next time I do it, I just do it alone. I wrote a list of things that I would do differently after my first startup when it, when it actually didn't work out. This was number one. Number two was actually to, to start from the market side. So without, because we, we won that competition, we were young and we thought, oh, we need to build a product. So we started investing time and money in building that technology with RFID and linking it to cameras and then uh, uploading everything to the internet. Whereas I, I, I only after, I think one year, I started talking to some amusement parks to figure, figure out what they would think about it. So this is now very common knowledge in lean startup and most startups are taught that, that you know, get, get, out, get out of the building right away. I didn't know that at the time, but I decided, okay, next time I start, just start, start with sales, not build the product and get outside. So that... The bridge, bridge was actually an, it is an outsourcing company with uh, right now most of the team in India. We still have, I think, one or, one or two guys in Ukraine, but because of the war, most of it stops. And uh, there's around 100 people right now in India working for uh, mostly clients in Western Europe and the US, also some in Indonesia. And I was in India last week. I hadn't been there for two and a half years. So the company runs smooth as a management team, et cetera. I'll, get, I'll tell more about that later on. So in this period from 2005 to 2008, I, I cried many times because if you start your first startup, you have no idea, then you're going to get a lot of problems thrown at you, which is mostly because you have no clue what to do on any aspects of, of running a business, even if you did an MBA. So I had a lot of problems. And before I started, I called 
my uncle, the one that I mentioned before, who had this jewelry company, and I explained him what I wanted to do, like outsourcing to India. And one thing he said, you go, why don't you join a company that is doing exactly what you're trying to do? Work there for two years and then learn what they, what they do and how they do it. And then you'll start. And I was like, yeah, that's a good idea. And no, thanks. I'm not going to do that. So I think that his, his advice had merit and it saves a lot of time if you do it like that. It saves you headache and you can learn on the expense of somebody else. At the same time, I also think that whatever phase you start at, you're going to have a lot of problems and, and setbacks. So you, you need to get through that. And you, you learn faster if you just do it yourself and get out there and expose yourself. Because one of the things that you need as an entrepreneur is, is grit and resilience and yeah, dealing with problems on a daily basis. I actually like dealing with problems right now. Not all of them. People problems are always a headache, but most of the problems are just, okay, good. That's a challenge and we can do something about it. So one of the problems I got was how do I do the distributed collaboration? Because I had clients in Holland and then later on in Sweden and in Germany. And then my team was in Ukraine and la later on also in India. How do you make that work? I had absolutely no idea. When I started, I also had no contacts with any Indian or Ukrainian company. So it's just, I started talking to people. I got introduced to some programmers in Odessa in the south of Ukraine started a small project together with them that I found from a client and then gradually you started learning it but you have to like in that case I had I just had to learn everything on on managing software projects I'd never done that managing other cultures other people far away managing clients timelines etc one of the other things that they were faced was working pro like my assumption at that time was you have to do projects and you have to do waterfall so everything we did was fixed price projects so i took a, a, a project from a client then i sent this to my team in ukraine they made an estimate they said oh this is going to take 500 hours this is the rate then i did the rate times two and i sold it to the client at a fixed price and then you make a planning with a deadline and you have to deliver that for 500 hours times whatever 25 euros and that's that's your commitment to the client. Now, I learned the hard way that that type of project management or, or delivering projects in that way is incredibly painful because it's hard to deliver everything in time in software projects. Everything is always later, there's extra requirements and there is always a, like you're always to blame, especially if you're a middleman like I was, because I, I didn't have my own company at that time in Ukraine or India. So I was in between taking projects from Dutch clients and then reselling the hours or the time of the guys in Ukraine. So anything that went wrong was always blamed on me and I had to compromise. So if, if the price had to be adjusted or some correction had to be made, it was me that suffered. And I always, you, you get in between. So I also learned that fixed price projects, waterfall way of working is not a very good idea, but it took me about six, seven years to figure that out. And at that time, Agile and Scrum were new. Nobody was using that yet. So it, I think my first Scrum training was 2011. And then I started thinking, okay, it can be done in a different way. And from that moment onwards, we started experimenting with uh, delivering in a more Agile way using the Scrum framework, which helped a lot. The other thought thing that I kept, and I still have it sometimes, but the other thing that I, that I kept bouncing against is sales guys. And this, like, the average programmer or tech guy cannot sell. So you need people to, to sell the technology service or product. And sales guys don't understand what the tech guys are doing. So they want to get the deal. They have skills to convince people, but they have no, no clue what, what the solution looks like or how the programmer is doing his work. And I burned, I think, three, four sales guys over a longer period of time. And none of them ever delivered the results or the outcomes that I expected. So I learned also that for a service firm, maybe for any type of company, sales is very challenging. And, and sales may not be the right way to approach clients or do deals nowadays. It's also in the past, it was easier because there was only phones or people were used to getting bucked. But now there are so many ways to approach people and to network that I think there's better ways than doing pure sales. We still have sales in, in Bridge because, as I said, the, the tech guys need sales and marketing. Otherwise, you don't sell anything. But when we started at Keeper, this was one of the first things I did. I don't want any sales guy anymore. 
because I think the best guys in our business, the best guys to sell the business or the service are the people that know the domain. So the agile coach who knows how to do the coaching or how to lead a transformation is the best salesperson because he has, has everything. So I'd rather teach a, an agile coach to, to, to do sales or to do it alongside him than to hire a sales guy and then teach him how to do agile because the second thing usually doesn't work. One of the, I'm going to just intermittently add some of the books or frameworks that helped me a lot. One of them is the E-Myth Revisited. It's a very old book. Uh, maybe somebody read it. Usually when I have a room full of people in the, when I'm doing a talk, nobody reads and nobody knows the book. And I, maybe you guys have read this. I hope so. But it's an old one that tells the story of how do you as an entrepreneur. So what he basically says is that most people who start a company do so because they learned a job in another company. So they, they've been a bookkeeper or they've been, I don't know, a salesperson. And then they start their company doing bookkeeping or doing sales. And he says that most people that start that way are actually substituting their job for more headache because they think, oh, this gives me freedom. But the moment they run their own business, they have to do everything around the technical job that they are doing. They have to do sales. They have to make clients satisfied, they have to do the administration, they have to do, uh, have a, need, need to have a website. So everything becomes their job and most get stuck there because a lot, that, it's a lot of work. So is it going to the next? So what he distinguishes in his book are three personalities that an entrepreneur needs. And I think these are also so three types that you need in the early days in your startup. So the entrepreneur is the, the visionary. So you have an idea, you see something that's not there yet or a problem that needs to be fixed and you set out to do that. And then you've got the technician who can be the executor. So it's the person doing the bookkeeping or in my case, for example, in Akipa, the technicians are the, the agile coaches because that's the core of our, our business. So they do the technical valuable work that the company delivers to client. And then you have managers. So the manager or the leader brings structure, manages work, manages finance, everything. But the entrepreneur has to stay free and, and play around with new stuff, with innovation, with the future of the company. So I, what I always keep in mind is in, in a company, when you start, you have to do everything. But as you grow as a founder, you need to start realizing that, oh, I, I need to play one of these three roles and I need other people to play the other roles. And the key sentence that I always have in mind is you need to work on your business and not in your business. Because if you work in your business, in my case, an example would be I invoice my hours to a client for scaling up or for doing agile coaching. Then I'm working as a technician in my company, whereas I think I'm, more, I'm stronger being the entrepreneur and working on the company, looking outside, what else is there? What else can we do? The other book that I think some people read this, but this is my, actually, it's maybe my, I have five books that are my favorites, which I almost all discuss in this session, but this, the four hour work week is, is probably number two. So Tim Ferriss wrote a book in which he describes how can you work four hours a week? So not four hours a day, but four hours a week, escape your nine to five, live anywhere and run a free and successful life. And the, the, the concept that he introduces is around how do you make sure that you only need to work four hours a week, but you can still run a company in which other people do the work or, or in which you've automated everything. So for example, here in Bali, there's a lot of digital nomads who do that. So they, they, have, they, they are alone, but they have a whole team around them with outsourced partners or other freelancers. And they create value as a team so that they only have to work a couple of hours a week. Uh, that's the idea. So it's more about how do you become more productive and efficient so that you have to work less. It's not about only working for hours and then laying on the beach because this guy is still working very hard, I believe. But it's more about how do you spend your time? So you work four hours on the most impactful stuff that brings you ahead or that brings your company ahead. So one of the concepts that he uses, and I think this is also an important part because many founders and entrepreneurs think about how to grow the company, how to build my company, how to build my team.
but you should also think about yourself, about your future, about your role, about your life, because you're an important part in your startup, especially in the early early years. So this this is what he calls dreamlining. So this is to make you see, okay, where do I want to, what do I want to have, what do I want to be, and what do I want to do, and you have to outline all these elements, like you make a sort of bucket list within each of those three categories, then you need to start thinking, how do I, like how much money do I need to earn in order to afford that? So in this case, he writes, oh, I want to have an Aston Martin. This is not my list, by the way, because I don't want one. It costs me, so he says, you need to think about leasing, not buying. So you have 2000, it costs $2,000 a month so that you have everything uh, outlined in how much do I need to, how much does it cost me on a monthly basis? And then you sum everything up and that's your target monthly income that will basically finance all your dreams. And for me, the interesting concept that he also introduces here is that as a, as a founder or as a human being, you can use this to define when is it enough? When do I earn enough to fulfill all my dreams? So because most people that become successful, they earn a lot of money. And once they have a lot of money, which was their dream early on, they still want to earn more money and continue doing this. And then you get into some sort of eternal rat race that you never get out of. So I, I like the idea that you quantify your dreams and then also cap it to a certain amount per month or per year, whatever, that you want to achieve. And once you achieve it, you have to change what you're doing because you're there. You have to maintain it instead of keep growing. At least that's the choice. So in 2007, while I had all the uh, problems, I also got married and got three kids. Well, they didn't come all at, at the same time, but uh, one after, well, two came at the same time in 2007, but then uh, it took a while, five years to get the one in the red shirt. In 2008, we also moved to India because I figured that one of the problems that I had, which I described is I was an intermediary in Bridge and that was very painful because you always get kicked out when there's problems. And I experienced that twice. There was a client that worked with a team in Kiev and then they went behind my back uh, and I said, you, we, we don't, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for getting us started, but we don't need you anymore. So I figured, okay, I need the only way to solve this is set up my own offices. Uh, so I moved to India with my family. Kids were very young at that age at that time. And we said we opened an office. I just went there with a friend. We started searching for an office space, hired a, hired a programmer. We had no idea what, where to start or where to search, but eventually we got an office after two weeks driving around in Kochi in the south of India. And, and uh, from there, we gradually started growing. Uh, now we have a very nice office, all, all furnished in our own way. And they have their own uh, bubble with 100 people, mostly working from office. So what, one thing that I got as a problem after this, because I decided I need to get more, I'm more control. So I need to set up my own offices. I started in three locations at the same time, which seemed a very good idea at that time because I was young and I thought, oh, let's just grab every chance that I can get to build my business. So I started in Ukraine. I started in Moldova and India in, in like in a period of one year. In Ukraine and Moldova, it was together with partners that I worked with before. So they, they, were, they were vendors and then we set up a joint venture. But in India, I set it up from scratch with a friend of mine. Looking back at that, this is one of the mistakes I made. And I, uh, yeah, it, it, I went to too many locations at the same time. And I thought that it doesn't matter. It's fine. We can manage that. But what I realized too late is you, you need, like you, the, comp, the company will only run if you have a very good team in there. If you have a good management team that, that runs the office, you have good programmers that deliver quality. And I couldn't get that in all three locations at the same time. Over time, I invested most of my time and energy in, in India also because I lived there. So I, I had more connection with the people working there. Um, so yeah, I, that I, I overestimated my own capability. And I think a lot of young entrepreneurs do this. They get overambitious, go, they spread themselves too thin early on and you lose focus if you do that and it doesn't help. It actually backfires resulting in very unhappy clients because we had these fixed price projects. I had no idea how to do the distributed collaboration. Uh, we kept having trouble in, in, in the deliveries. So customers were quite unhappy. And this was in the first like three to four years. I was still trying to figure out how do I make this guy look a bit happier than what he looks in, uh, in this picture.
Now, in the period 2009 to 2015, I put baby boss here because the problems were still there, but I started learning more. I started growing up a bit as, a, as an entrepreneur. And one of the things, and this is uh, one of the topics in this, in this talk, one of the, the, the groups that I joined was Entrepreneurs Organization, EO. There is, they have a chapter, I think three chapters in Indonesia, but the, the vibe that I, I've, I've met them a couple of times, the vibe that I got in Indonesia is different from what I've seen in at least Holland or in some of the other countries. So EO is a group, is a, it's a global organization with uh, chapters or forums in every country or in multiple in a country. And they are entrepreneurs helping entrepreneurs. So you get into a group of five to six entrepreneurs and you keep each other accountable you share things they help each other they're not allowed to do business with each other within that group but they are coaching and mentoring each other to grow and to uh, to scale up their business so this was set up amongst others by Vern Harnish who is the author of uh, scaling up so he the book was first called mastering the Rockefeller habits and then when he saw that there's a lot of startups in ecosystems uh, everywhere around the globe, he, he phrased the coin scaling up. So he, he changed the name of the book, but it's largely the same. So it's uh, th this is a, a framework or a methodology or whatever you call it, or an operating system that you can use to structure your company, to create discipline, clarity, and, and, and grow step by step. Uh, Peter, who is also joining on the 3rd of November as one of the facilitators in our masterclass, also became my personal mentor. So he, for about a year, he was my mentor. And we had like once a month or twice a month, we had a call. And I, you know, the years before that, I thought, you know, I don't need this. I know everything. I'll, I'll figure it out myself. And I re realized too late that if you have a good mentor, it's very powerful. He's, I think, 15 or 20 years older than me. So he has done what I've done before, and he can speak from experience. And I think that's incredibly powerful. Now that entrepreneurs organization, and there's multiple, like Founders Institute has this as well. There's many organizations that have experienced mentors that can help you get through your shit or your problems and your challenges. Now, I want to talk a bit about scaling up and how how it saved my life. I think I wouldn't have died without it, but it definitely helped a lot. So one of the big challenges that you have as you try to scale up your company is that you need more people. Like the more, the more you scale up, the more people you need. And what you can see in this diagram is that if you're two people, you have only two communication lines. Then when you add a person, you've got six communication lines, right? And then you add a fourth one. I don't know how many this is, but it's a lot. And you can imagine if you get to 40 or 400, all those communication lines can lead to frustration, miscommunication, headaches. And most of the trouble for scaling up is within this. So the, the way, the, the amount of people, the maybe the, the, the match and the intelligence of the people that you hire and the way you structure the collaboration with, pe with the people in your company is, is, is defining the success of your company. And, but it, so it's the headache, but it's also the solution because even if you have a product company, you need people to scale. Without people, you cannot. So what happens if you have more people, and I think up, up until whatever, five or 10 people, it's okay. This is fine. You can have you can have chaos. You can have people doing ad hoc stuff. You can have people all over the place. Lack of focus, lack of money. It's all fine. It's the early days. But once you get beyond 10 or 15 people, you need to get more structure because otherwise it explodes. Because if you have 20 people running all over the place, then you're going nowhere. So what happens usually in these early days, you have a lot of chaos because of mismanagement and miscommunication. Now, what scaling up brings is the opposite so you try to bring peace right it brings space so you have more focus you have more time you have more cash because you prioritize the important things you work in a structured way you also try to earn money from the market or maybe get investors but i'll get back to that later on you have more predictability on, on people so what people do you how do you attract the right people what are the expectations how do you want them to behave how do you give them feedback and you also have more predictability on your processes. So this is the, the sort of structure and clarity that the framework and scaling up can bring. Uh, and, and I think alignment is also an important one. I'll show you one of the tools later on that, that helps with this. 
but the alignment means that those 10 or 20 or 30 people all know what's expected, where are we going, and how do I know if I'm doing well? So you have a clear strategy and direction, and people know what's expected from them and where they're going. Now, this, this is the flywheel that Vern basically describes. So first of all, you have people, and you want to get the right people in the right seat at the right moment. Right? That's your starting point. Then you want to figure out what are these people going to do? So what's the strategy? What, are, what products and services do we sell? What clients do we approach? Whatever else, our strategy is mapped. So you have those same people doing the right things. Then they start executing. So executing means they, they are doing their things right. So the strategy defines what they need to do. They're doing the right things. So they focus on the most important things. And then the execution means they're doing it in the right way. And then the, and the result of that is cash. So if you have the right people doing the right things with the right strategy, they execute in a disciplined way, the result is cash. So you earn money and that money can then be invested back into more people or better people and, and uh, the wheel goes on. So the more, the better you get at this, the more you start flying. But the problem is usually you're blocked in one of those four. So the, the flywheel gets blocked and the role of an entrepreneur or a management team is to figure out where are we blocked? What's the key thing that is blocking us in our strategy or in our execution? And then start fixing that one by one. Now on the people side, one of the tools that Scaling Up describes is this one of the A players. So what I found in, in, in Scaling Up, this helps you to figure out what kind of people to attract and measure them or give feedback on two aspects. So on the horizontal axis, productivity, of course you want them to produce outcomes, but you also want to do it, you want them to do it in the right way. So the, the vertical axis are the core values or the behaviors that you expect from people. Now he, we have A, B, C, and then B or C, or maybe D players. So the, the A players are the people that are producing outcomes they're your superstars and they're also doing it in the right way. So they match the core values. They behave as you want them. B players are the people that are less productive, but they're matching in your DNA. So they behave well, but they just don't make outcomes as you expect them or to a certain degree. Now, B players can be coached to become A players. You can, you can get them to the right side. And B players are, A and B players, obviously you want to keep in your company. Now, C players are the people that are not productive, so they're not creating outcomes, and they're also not behaving in the right way. I'm, I'm thinking that most of you will conclude, okay, so those are the people we need to get out of the company, and, and I think that's a yes. Now, maybe if somebody's all the way in the right top, you still want to give them a try, but if you map out your people on this diagram, because you could do that, you could put people, like you, if, you're, if you're four leaders, each person could just map all the employees on this matrix and then see what you come up with. But if somebody is down in C, then I think you have to make the tough call there. And, and BC players, the thing with them is, and this might, for example, be a superstar salesperson who bribes people to get his sales or who cuts corners, right? So he's, he's getting the outcomes, but he's not matching the values or the behavior that you want. And that's dangerous because that person is going to show the rest of the company that what he is doing, if you keep him, what he is doing is apparently what the boss is expecting him to, us to do. So they're going to do the same thing. They're going to bribe, they're going to cut corners because they think that's right. And they, this guy is getting rewarded and can stay in the company. So for me, this is a very simple and helpful tool to figure out what, what people do you want to attract and how do you decide to keep them. And I think the underlying thing is you also need to define your core values. So you need to be very clear on what kind of behavior do you expect from people. And I, I always, when I start a company, I always spend time on that in the, in the beginning when the team is still small, because you want to make sure that people understand what you want as a founder or what you want as a group. So do you want people to show resilience or be friendly or whatever, whatever you think is important in terms of behavior? You want to define that and reiterate that so that people continuously understand what's expected. And you can also use that as a mechanism to give feedback to people. Because the most important thing to give feedback on is behavior. It, as long as people match your core values, 
they've got potential and they match with your team. And I think this is maybe even more important than productivity. Of course, you want people to be productive as well, but I think you get the picture here. Another book that I, it's not directly linked to scaling up, but once you get into some scaling up course or you get into EO, for example, a lot of, like Fern is always using a lot of books and authors that he repeatedly brings in as, as sub topics within those within the flywheel or within his one page strategic plan and this is one of them so this is about the one minute manager meets the monkey uh, and this for me it's a very instrumental book because it explains the idea that the monkey is the next step to solve a problem and a monkey is always sitting on somebody's shoulder now the problem is most companies or most people want to get rid of that monkey right so they have an inclination to not own the problem or not own the solution to a problem and give it to somebody else. So monkeys start jumping around in a company. And if you're a leader, you have to be very aware of that because you, you definitely don't want to take the monkey off one of your team to your shoulder. But if you're working in the company and you're very engaged in the operational day-to-day -day stuff, especially in the beginning, your inclination will be to do it yourself. Right? You'll take the monkey and you fix it because in many cases, a, a founder or entrepreneur can do a lot. Like we are used to do anything that needs doing. So we have a wide spectrum that we are, we're comfortable with and we can do it fast because we're trained to do that, right? You, it's your company, you're passionate about it. So if there's a problem, you're going to solve it right away. You're quick. And the problem with that is that it needs time to accept that other people are sometimes doing it differently or maybe slower or whatever, but that monkey, eventually, if you want to scale up, you need to make sure that those monkeys stay with your team and you remove as many monkeys as possible from your own shoulder. Now, this is about strategy. So about doing the, the right things. And he uses a one-page strategic plan. It's actually, this is the one page strategy plan and you have like four columns. I'm not gonna explain everything. On the left side, you have the long-term stuff. So you have your core values, you have your purpose, you have your mission, a purpose or mission is the same, your why. Um, you have your B hack, which is your, your big, big, hairy, audacious goal. So it's a vision long-term into the future that you're working towards. And then you go into targets for the next, I usually use three years. So you define what are the main capabilities that we need to build in the company within the next three years in order to realize our long-term aspirations. So you can have five priorities there for the next three years. And then you translate that into key, key initiatives for this year. So the next 12 months, what are the key things that we're going to do in order to make those capabilities happen within the next three years. So this gives you, and above that, but above key initiatives and key capabilities, you can also put numbers. So you put metrics in terms of revenue, market capitalization, whatever, whatever profit, uh, number of employees, you can put anything. So you know whether you're on track or not. There's more into this page, but I think this is the most important part. So you basically get your complete strategy onto one page and it looks easier than it is because to fill it, takes time you need to discuss you need to brainstorm and usually it helps to have an outsider on that one one very important thing that i found here also is that he there is space for maximum five priorities in the, in everything that you fill so if you make your key initiatives and what Vern always says when i see him speak is you never have more than five priorities. If you have more, you don't know what you're doing. You're going all over the place. So it forces you to go in, like to go for a handful of priorities that you need to focus on. And those five need to be the most important, most impactful priorities that brings you your company ahead or you as an individual ahead. And I'm inclined to even say five is a lot. Might, might be even better to have only three because if you have three, you can do it with high quality, fast, and you are, you're focused on solving those three rather than five. Now, next step is you need to execute that strategy. So you need to make sure that people are doing their things right. So that's the second page in the sort of one page strategic plan. And this goes into the quarter. So what you see here is you have a column that defines the same, the, the next three to five priorities for this quarter for the next 90 days 
And that needs to show that this is what we're going to do in order to move towards the one year goals. So you drill everything down to what's going, what we're going to do right now on the short term to make everything happen. And then in, in the middle, there is a theme. I will not discuss that too much, but on the right side, there is the personal accountability. So every individual in your team, you could start with your leadership team or with your founders, and then later on also give it to other people. Every person needs to have a clear plan for himself on what is he or she going to do in order to make the company's top priorities for the quarter happen. So you have a, a personal accountability showing that uh, Adi or Nanda is doing these three to five things this quarter, and, and we can measure it also. So there's a due date, there is a, a metrics on top of your KPI. Now, what we, for example, in, in Brits, I've been using this for, I think, more than a decade. In Keeper, we use OKRs to replace this. So in, instead of this, you could play with this. You can use OKRs or whatever you want. But the, the underlying principle is about focusing your team's attention to, to do the most important things for this quarter, make it transparent, and also measure progress on that. And then... The next part of this execution is, is a meeting cadence. So you, have, you need to structure your alignment with the team or with the different teams that have certain responsibilities. So what we tend to, to facilitate is you do a yearly planning to update your one-year plan. Then you do a quarterly planning to update the page that you're looking at. Then you do a monthly strategic planning or a meeting to align, okay, are we on track to make our quarterly goals? Then you do a weekly meeting and a weekly meeting can be per team. So you can do it in the marketing, in the sales, uh, in the tech. That weekly meeting is to align, okay, what are we going to do as a team this week or as individuals to accomplish progress towards the quarterly goals that we have set? And then you also have a very short daily alignment, can be five minutes in which you just check in to see, is there any, any like what, what have you been working on? Is there anything that blocks you from accomplishing your goals for this week. And if there is, then we can help to resolve those blockers. So I found that if you have a clear plan like this, because this is your plan, and a very strong alignment rhythm, then you keep your people in sync. And that's one of the main instruments to create this predictability that I showed earlier, because you get discipline, clarity, and alignment. Now, the fourth part is cash. And you need money for growth. Now, the first one that I found, especially in the last few years in, in Indonesia, it seems that many startups or scale-ups are thinking that the only way to run a company or a startup is to raise funds. So all the efforts go into fundraising. And I think this is not necessarily a very good thing because you spend a lot of time raising funds. It's not easy because VCs or angels don't just put money into your company. You have to spend time on making decks, making financials, doing pitches, and most of them will say no. So it's a, it's a huge effort to do that. So I think mo money is a means to an end and it's not necessarily the goal. So there's other ways to get a healthy company. And I think traditionally before this whole startup, if VC thing started, companies started and then when they made profits they used those profits to reinvest into their business and then grow grow from there if they thought i need to accelerate they would go to a bank they would say look mr bank i've got some profits here i've got a healthy business now could you do that times five and give me a loan for that and i'll pay you back every month and that's how they used to scale Nowadays, people think, oh, the only way to do it is to get, to get rich very fast. And to get there, I need to get money from a VC because that's what everybody else is doing. Of course, there are, there are concepts that you need that for. Like, for example, the, the Uber model seems to be one, one takes all, right? So you need to move very fast. But for most businesses, you don't. What, what's the rush, right? If you take it a bit easier, you actually have more time to figure out how to be a good entrepreneur, how to scale your business, uh, what the client needs. And there's always space for multiple players. So that's, that's my view. But I think the, the, the important part here is that you, you are not running that business for the money. The money is actually the petrol in your car. It's the engine. You have, you're running an engine. You need the petrol to run. But your goal should never be money. Your goal is to create something, like in whatever it is that you're doing. Now, after I implemented... This scaling up and I got a lot of mentoring and uh, 
I got to a certain point where my team got more self-organized. So I'm a firm believer of, of self-organization, right? Putting all those monkeys to the team. So they organize and me as an entrepreneur, I can work on the business and, and focus more on outside and on vision and direction to help them and step in where it's needed, right? So I become a coach. So the team became more self-organized. So at that time I thought, okay, I want to, I, I was always thinking uh, if you run a service business, it's a bit, you know, it, it, most cool startups are building products, right? You don't build a service business. So I figured I need, to, I want to build a, a product. And then Akipa was actually, even my team doesn't know this, Akipa was first a platform to find software development teams all over the world that you could hire for a project. So if you, for example, want to build, you're in the US and you want to build a ERP system using .NET or whatever, you could search in this platform for teams that have built ERP systems in .NET. You can see there the, the team profiles, the, the client projects we've worked on, testimonials, et cetera. And then you can hire the team directly through the platform. So it's basically like a freelance website, but then for teams instead of individuals. I spent, I think, one year and a half on that, built a team. I invested $100,000, I think, in, of, of our own rich money into it. And, and we were not getting traction. So it was a marketplace. And I learned also that marketplaces are not that easy to build. But the, the, the supplier side, getting teams on the platform worked fairly easily. So there were a lot of, uh, I think we had 100 or 150 companies that uploaded the teams on the, on, the, on the portal. So we had a lot of supply, but then to get the demand, it didn't work. Uh, we got a few projects, but mostly through personal contacts. And I actually set out to build this product in order to solve the, the sales bottleneck that I spoke about earlier in, in a service company. And, and and I thought, okay, if I don't, if I have a platform instead of salespeople, then clients will come automatically and I don't need to do sales anymore. But unfortunately, it didn't work that way. So this, uh, I pulled the plug on that around 2015. And that was also the year I was really done and burned out. Peter once told me that I think the, the life span or the expi expiration date of an entrepreneur is seven years. And I think there's value in that. So he says you have you can run a company with all your energy as a founder for about seven years. And that's around the time you need to start thinking of doing something else or stepping aside. I managed to do it for 10 years, but I got very, I, I would say almost burned out at that time. So in 2015, I decided, okay, I, I have three options. Either I shut down my company or I sell it. I tried, but that's not easy with a service company and they never want to pay what you want for it. Or I step aside. And that's what I did. So in 2015, I decided, let's try. So I'll hand over all the power to Krishna, who was at that time the COO and made him CEO. And I just stepped aside for a while to see what would be happening. So I didn't do much for, for like three to six months and the company actually survived. And what I also did is I thought, okay, by stepping aside, I was, I was really done. So I accept that if the company runs down, like goes bankrupt or stops functioning at all, I accept that. Like that's the worst possible outcome. And of course I wanted to try and improve on that. So because I have Krishna on board and uh, also a team around him that helps, uh, that does great work. It's still running, it's growing, it's healthy, it's profitable. And this was probably the best decision I made in the last, uh, was it seven or eight years? And, and it's still running. and. Um, uh, I, I, I spent about, I think I spent less than the four hours a week that uh, Tim Ferriss talks about. And this enabled me to start new things. So in, in, in the period after that, from 2016 to right now, I added this, uh, do what you love and, and love what you do. I think this is always valid. You always need to do that. But I decided that this is the most important thing for the next phase. So that's uh, when I moved to Bali. I took my family and my, my wife and three kids over here. Actually, as an experiment, we thought, let's try one year and see what happens. If everybody likes it, we stay. If not, then we'll go back. And since then, we are, we are extending it on a year-to-year -year basis. So every year, we stay one more year. Or every year, we decide, do we continue for a year or not? Uh, we're still here. So at that time, I, I started surfing. And I thought, OK, I can do surfing all day and, uh, and relax. But I think if you're an entrepreneur, that's, that's not really the path that, that works, especially if you're still young. So 
that's when I started this community actually in 2016 uh, as a first step to start introducing Agile to Indonesia. So we started doing meetups. We started uh, an Agile conference in 2017, I believe. And there was a lot of interest to hire, to hire us as, as trainers. At the beginning, we did only Agile and Scrum training. Uh, this was the first training that I ever did, actually, uh, organized by uh, Sampuna because I was not even allowed to work in Indonesia because I didn't have my kitas yet. Um, and I always felt that with Akipa, I was able to get wind in the back. And there's a few reasons. First of all, it's the model is similar to the first company I built. So it's people delivering a service and you're basically selling time. So when you do it a second time, you can remove all the errors or the mistakes you made in the first one and, and build a better version of your first company. It's hard. Sometimes it becomes hard to fix your first, but if you start from scratch, then apparently it's easier. It's also because I found a niche, which is agile, agile transformation. And nobody else was doing that yet, except for one Indonesian Scrum trainer. And uh, I think that helps a lot because with the software outsourcing business, it was a very crowded market. When I started, not so much, but over time, it became very crowded because there's anybody from India, or Ukraine or South America can offer outsourcing services to Western clients. And they, you know people get bombarded by all those companies on a daily basis. But with Akipa, there is no not much competition. It's a, a smaller niche. And we also build the brand fairly quickly from the beginning, grew a team. And, and that helps a lot to remain in like to get the wind in the back and now i'm building a whole ecosystem with uh, we have angels and founders which we collaborate uh, with kumpo with so this is what we, we lost the two, yesterday there was uh, an event in jakarta in which we have usually four or five startups that pitch to experts or to investors and they give feedback short, sort of like a shark tank uh, and then the Valley investment club is the uh, investment in impact startup supercharges I already explained. And next year we're gonna set up a fund as well. So kind of building a new ecosystem around uh, startups and scaling up. So short wrap up, I've got a few things that I want to conclude with before uh, we can go into some Q and A. So this is my belief right now. You need to focus on impact first. Impact doesn't mean saving the planet. It can mean whatever you do for your customers and for the people or your employees. So you want to focus on doing good stuff, having impact on your clients and your people. Second is scaling. So once you have that foundation of good people and servicing clients in a good way, then you can start scaling because there will be more demand. More people want to work for you. More clients want to hire you and then money will come. And I think it's in that order. So it's people, business, and profit, not in the other way around. Then based on all my speaking about the scaling up framework, the, the first thing that, or the, maybe it's the eternal thing that you need to be doing as a leader or founder is to find the bottleneck in that flywheel. So figure out what, what is holding us back. What's our number one constraint or bottleneck? Is it in people, strategy, execution, or cash? then find out what can you do to fix this, make those your priorities in your quarterly or yearly plan and keep doing this. Because if you keep fixing the bottlenecks in that flywheel, there is no other way than your flywheel starts flying. Because if you have a flywheel that turns and you remove the blockers all the time, it will start turning. It's just a question, how long does it take? And can you survive as a founder? Meaning, can you mentally survive and can you keep, as, keep the cash flowing so that your team and your company is healthy enough to keep fixing those problems? I also want to close with, I think that the beginning is always the hardest. For most people, uh, you have to start from scratch. You have no idea. Every option is open. That's, that's challenging. And I think the second thing is you need to love solving problems because that's one thing that my wife always tells me you keep it like you always have problems to solve that you're thinking about. The good news is as you get older and you have more businesses, I think it matters less. So you have problems and you've seen them all almost and it's easier to deal with it. But when you're earlier, earlier stage startup, founder, they can really keep you awake and give you headaches. Uh, but yeah, that's the life of an entrepreneur. And I think this, yeah, this talk can help you to gain some insights in 
how to deal with those problems, how to identify them, and then how to work to solve them. That's my presentation. Is there any feedback from uh, Dinda or from people that have questions? Okay. Thank you, Hugo. So anyone want to ask question to Hugo? It's okay if you don't want to speak directly, you can chat in the chatting room. As there are still 24 people in the call, there must be something, somebody wondering about something. Yeah, exactly. People, planet, profit. That is one right terms for startup. Maybe sometimes startup just only focus on what they can do on the products, uh, directly launch the product, uh, never think about what is the impact that they want to bring to the society. It is one thing that I found in the startup community. Yeah, they're just think they're thinking about what? Not about society, but about? They're only thinking on or focus on the product that they want to make. Yeah. But the impact they want to bring. Yes. So if anybody has feedback or questions, you can also just open the cam or speak or write. Yeah. Thanks, Mario. Or you want to share your experience also can be, can share. Not only asking question for Hugo. Hi, hi, hi Hugo. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I think yeah. I will, I was planning to chat a bit, but uh, just speak up a bit. Um, okay, that's great, thanks. Yeah, um, I, I'm Mario from uh, Staffing, preferably called something. And we're uh, currently we are a Series A funding company. Yeah. Um, what I'm experienced uh, since uh, since the beginning uh, doing something, and uh, we are we are finding uh, very hard to 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 decide our PMF, uh, the product market fit. Uh, in your experience, how 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 what your uh, uh, tips or, or um, I don't know clue to, to find uh, your product market fit. Is there anything uh, you can uh, share with us? And, and what what kind of product are you building? Because I've seen the name, but I don't. Yeah. Um. So something and is a uh, we're a digital staffing company. Uh, we create. Uh, basically, we provide uh, outsourcing uh, services for blue collar workers. Uh, currently, we are having two uh, type of uh, products. One is uh, the service itself, uh, MPO or BPO, uh, business process outsource and manpower provider. Uh, yeah. The other side is we also creating a platform, uh, you know, to uh, sourcing uh, to source the, the 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 workers and create an an HRIS to 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 integrate with the service. Uh, as a result, we have like an end-to-end -end, uh, solution uh, as a support of HR function in each our principle. Yeah. Okay, and and um, because it seems to me that the the biggest driver of your product market fit initially is sales, right? So you're you're trying to sell a service in which you find blue collar workers for a specific project or for a customer temporarily. Yeah, at the time actually, uh, we currently have the the, the best model currently um however at that time uh, i think one of the the, the the backlog the main blocker is uh the the, the you know uh, in indonesia sourcing itself has been like i don't know 30 years 40 years and so they already have a, a, a conventional traditional uh, players that already been connected with uh principles for like i don't know one or two generations, uh, so it's really really hard to us to to to, to penetrate the market at first. Uh, but after the startup uh, booming in Indonesia and all the tech companies rising and PC rising, and you know the whole ecosystem is open up and trying to 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 attack the tech company first uh, because it's in our side our circle. Uh, 
but yeah, you know, currently the tech center is coming and, you know, all the, the tech companies are laying off. Yeah. <laughs> and they're cutting the budget for, for everything, basically. So we kind of shift to, to uh, more conventional non qc back companies to find sustainability and, and, and to diverse our risks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, for me, to me, what it always looks like is for a service like this, the, the, it's slightly easier to find product market fit because you're, you're, you're selling. So you go to customers, you can meet them face to face and then see what are their needs and you can modify your proposal or the person that you're proposing based on the, the conversation that you're having. So I think it depends on what type of customers you're talking to. And I think if, if I were in your position, what I think I would do is to see, can I categorize certain types of companies like VC backed startups, maybe factories, uh, whatever, uh, waste collection, I don't know what. And then, yeah, and then you know, per sector, just talk to 10, 10 companies and, and try to draw conclusions. Like, is this, is this the, right, the, right, the right client for mm-hmm. the service that we're providing or not? And I think the platform side, because when you talk about product, I think that should follow follow the service later on. So you're mm-hmm. it's basically automating the service that you're having. That's like the platform that I was mentioning before for the teams hiring software teams around the globe. I think that's the the mistake I made is I thought that if you b- build a platform, then people just come to the platform. You do marketing, you attract them through ads or whatever, and then on the website they'll find your great people and they'll just book them on on the website. And I think it doesn't work that way. So I think mm-hmm. your approach of doing it as as a service through selling and then slowly automate some of those services into a platform that's the right approach i understood Thanks. and i also think you know if you get a downturn like this you know i i, I always find a lot of inspiration from Vern Harness. but what he used to say is there's two things that you need when economy starts running bad right first of all you need to make sure you get enough cash in your bank account so make sure you cash up when you see the recession coming. Second is you just need to sell more. Mm-hmm. So where, where earlier clients come to you, now maybe you have to talk to five more clients to get one deal, and that's your job. Yeah. yeah. Completely agree with you, uh, Hugo. Um, I think um, many of uh, Startup Indonesia are currently facing a, um, you know, uh, bankruptcy and, and all of this because we are, we are, we are, we are, we have something uh, wrong in our fundamental uh, when it comes to VC, uh, you know, uh, VC backing company, and you you only focus on a GMV uh, and then forget about the profit contribution. I think uh, what I can sh- uh, share uh, in this forum is also uh, for us for something that we all we 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 focusing on a Pareto principle. So we trying to yeah. to 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 solve. Uh, 20% that impact and 90%. And also we, we take a look very hard, uh, very focused on a profit contribution. I think, think uh, the unit economics have to be positive uh, in, 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 in start in the beginning. Yeah. And it sounds like your, your model can accommodate for that as well because you have the service. So you're not relying only on developing a product which cannot generate money yet, right? Yeah, true. Yeah, so you should be able to get through it. Hopefully, <laughs> <Cross me. laughs> Thanks, yeah, happy, happy to have another chat afterwards if sure. uh, you need help. Yeah. Okay, sure. thank, you. thank you, Pak Mario from Sampingan or Staffing. Thank you, Benio. Okay, we have next question from Nico. Nico. Hi, Hugo and team. Thanks for the presentation. I would like to ask if you can please explain a bit more how you can, how you close that know-how gap at bridge which often exists between the sales and the deaf people <laughs> i think my answer is i haven't <laughs> so so you know krishna the ceo has actually hired way more people now mostly on so they have much more marketing now but there is also a team of i think seven or eight sales people from india and uh, Krishna and Divya, now that COVID is gone, are also traveling to Europe now to meet clients, but that divide is still there. So last week I was in India and we were discussing this question actually, and they still struggle because one of the things that happens, for example, in a software company is the 
the develop if there's a project the team estimates they they analyze and they want to be on the safe side right so the team wants to add a lot of hours to make sure that if they get the project they can deliver in time right so they pump up the hours but the salesperson wants the opposite because otherwise you can't sell so that tension is still there and i think as you get new people in your teams you, you will have this struggle forever and i think this is also the nature of sales the only so my, the only way for me to fix it was what I said about Akipa. In our, in Akipa, we don't have it. So I don't know what business you're you're running, Nico. But if you have a company or a service business that has people that have more, is, they are more like consultants, so they have knowledge. Then those people are actually the best ones to sell it. So you could, for example, go for we only have marketing generating leads. Maybe some pre sales person to qualify whether a lead is worth talking to and then putting one of your knowledgeable guys as a consultant to face the, to talk to the client to figure out what are the needs so you have less of the typical salesperson who just goes out cold calls people and tries to close deals i think that's one consideration but again if you have programmers they are not the people you want to make you want to talk to the client but but maybe the project manager or somebody who is on the technical side, but not a pure salesperson. What, one more answer, I think, can I, if it's if it if it's tech, if you have a tech company, I still don't know. Then, then the agile way of working can also help because instead of doing this process, I get a client request. The salesperson tries to capture the needs. Then they ask the people to estimate the work and then we send a proposal what you could do is to organize for example a workshop in which you don't do the analysis but the first thing that the salesperson proposes is i'll get two of my best guys or maybe even a designer a programmer and a tester into a workshop of four hours and then together with them we'll map out the requirements so then you get the tech guys to speak to the client at an early stage and they co-develop the solution for the client that can be another model but if I if I ever find the magic bullet on this, I'll ping you. I hope that helps, Nico. Yeah, that can exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There is a feedback from Panico. Okay, thanks for the input. Okay, Panico, do you need any explanation more? Okay. Okay. If anyone want to share um, their journey during the scaling up on the startup uh, ecosystem, or you want to ask anything to Hugo, you can chat, or you can directly put the hand emoticon up, like me, like I did. Oh, Dana, you want to ask something? Oh no. <laughs> uh, hello. <laughs> yes, Panik. Ah, okay. Sorry, I didn't put my hand up. I just unmuted. It seems like That's sorry okay. for that, but uh, yeah, I just thought that I will talk through the microphone. Uh, typing sure. takes longer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, what what I was thinking when when you explained that last point, uh, Hugo, is um, I mean, what what I often see is that we not only have that know how gap, for example, between the sales guys and the dev guys, but also, um, I mean, of course, the sales guys try to sell whatever they can. Sometimes they shouldn't, but I mean, they, they are there to, to bring the revenue in. And, uh, but sometimes we have that gap, uh, which actually exists because they cannot really feel or know or, um, have no real understanding of what the what the development is actually capable of uh, in both yeah. directions for example they undersell or they oversell because they have not that know-how of, of uh, which the tech guys have um, and especially that is the case if new people come into the team right so um, how do you or do you have an idea I mean, it is impossible that the deaf guys become sales guys. That is clear. And and uh, but on the other side, the the sales guys cannot 
um, go to university again and uh, study programming, right? So no, 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 <laughs> no that, that's, all right. no, that's it. No, I, I, I actually think the only way to play with it is to put them together in a room, and and so you have you've got the client, you've got some of the tech guys, and then you got a, a facilitator that can be a salesperson to to have the discussion about the needs, the possibilities, and uh, uh, like for the client and also on the tech side. So that together with the client, you co-create a solution for them. But but the question, of course, is is the ticket size of your client big enough to justify that, uh, and or is the client maybe even willing to pay for it? Because it's an yeah, it's a bigger yeah. investment. But but you could do the math, right? Because if you have if you have three sales guys for a year and they sell X, then maybe doing this with without the sales guys, you only need one salesperson. But instead, your team invests in select clients that you think are are worthwhile and then you do those workshops you could you know sort of do the math which one works better yeah okay great uh thanks for your answer help a lot okay i will thanks. unmute happy, again happy, embrace happy try to, to raise my hand next time <laughs> no, no, sorry all good it's yeah. okay thanks, thanks for the question <laughs> yeah okay thank you panico we have another question from nerissa I, Hugo, would like to ask, is there any advice for established company that want to go faster and start to implement Agile? Thank you in advance. Um, that's that's a multi-layered question, Nerissa. So I would, like my first question would be in which uh, company are you working and then what level are you, like what's your role? Because the answer to that depend, that, that, that influences how, how I'm going to answer your question. So what? What's your position and what are you doing exactly? Are you in a team or are you on the leadership level? Mungkin Mbak Nerissa bisa langsung as a scrum I mean master. the team as Scrum Master. Okay, clear. So um, I think what, what I've seen in the last few years is that if a bigger company wants to adopt Agile, mostly it starts with with a team that that has the ambition to work in a different way. Usually on the on the IT side. So I'm assuming you're working in a um, in an IT team. So I think you you could start running Scrum or Agile in your project team or in your product team, and then start showing results. By this new way of delivering projects the the issue you would face is you need to get people around it also to buy into it so your product owner or the sponsor needs to see what you're doing and give his blessing and also support because they need to they need to change that behavior to make scrum work so i think as a scrum master if you are the one initiating it i would look for you know, one team or one one project or product that you could run an experiment with try to get direct let's say direct superiors involved so the product manager uh, maybe the sponsor of the project explain them how scrum works and what you what you want to achieve what kind of improvements you envision by implementing agile and then start that as a pilot for i don't know three to six months and then show the outcome so visualize everything around the this is how why or how the new way of working is bringing benefits the other thing that you could try before um, during or after that pilot is to get for example a keeper in to do a free sharing session with your leadership and then i would try to shoot as high as you can bod level and see can we do i know two one or two hour sharing session with your bod or with one level down about the benefits of agile for their organization so as a scrum master i think you can influence that kind of thing by or getting getting them for example into a meetup or we could host our meetup in your office or we could do it as an online session for your leadership and then from that you we could start inspiring them together with you so we could show your outcomes on the team level and also show them what's possible so i think this is the if there is no leader in the organization yet putting this on the agenda and you are the one trying to bring this in i think that that would be Try bottom up and also try to get awareness to the leadership however you can. So if they say no at your first attempt, just try through another leader, etc. I hope that helps, uh, Nerissa. But this is always a complicated puzzle because the ideal case is you have a CEO who drives the agile transformation and is, is driving it as a program. But if that's not there, then I think this is my answer.
Okay. I think we're at time box, uh, Dina. Yes, not at Hugo, and thanks a lot, Narisa. Thank you, Mbak Narisa. And we have reached the time box. And thank you all for uh, attending this event. And thank you for Hugo for sharing a lot of things uh, and a lot of, a lot of insightful uh, things to our attendees. And thank you again, Paniko. Yeah, thanks for the questions and listening for the, to the long one-way street, <laughs> one-way dial monologue. Okay. Terima kasih teman-teman yang sudah hadir. Uh, mungkin nanti bisa langsung scan uh, beberapa. Uh, aku bakal sharing screen sedikit ya, Hugo. Untuk scaling up master kelasnya, kalau misalnya ada teman-teman yang interest untuk join di scaling up master class, bisa langsung scan atau stay sampai akhir uh, sesi ini. Jadi kita bisa langsung uh, jelaskan untuk scaling up master class. Oke, okay. terima kasih teman-teman atas kehadirannya. Thank you, Hugo. Thank you and good night. Good night, selamat malam. Terima kasih. Untuk yang ingin bertanya lebih lanjut mengenai scaling up,